Sabbath for you. In spite of uh, whatever perplexities or sorrows we may have had during the week, Sabbath is happy. And uh, I think we're happy largely because of all the hope that we have, the reason we're here. All that we have to be thankful for, to praise God for. This morning, I'm going to be continuing with uh, somewhat of a series I've been doing that's been relating history to prophecy. And I'll go into a little more detail. I'll review some. Every week, I know there are people who are here that uh, haven't been here, maybe haven't heard what I've been talking about leading up to this. And so today, I'll take uh, considerable time in review but also presented maybe from a different uh, perspective, different aspects for those of you who have been here, to look at some of the thoughts that, that lead into my main subject today. You'll see the title there is The Great Deformation. Most of us have heard of the Great Reformation, right? Well, we wouldn't have needed a reformation if there hadn't have been a deformation. And so we're going to be talking a little bit more about what has happened to Christianity since the time of Christ, since the time of the Apostles, what actually has happened, and more importantly, why? And how we can learn from this and hopefully have an experience that goes in the opposite direction. <laughs> Rather than deformation, we are in need of continuing reformation. I also put on the screen here for the good of the people and the nation. And the reason is, is kind of an overarching thought that I've had through this, is that a lot of what has been done that has led to the demise of the church has been done for the good of the people and the good of the nation. I took this thought actually out of scriptures, where you may recall that Caiaphas, the high priest, went to the church at that time and said, do we need to put Jesus to death for the good of the people and for the good of the nation? You realize that the premise, the basis for crucifying Jesus was for the good of the people and the good of the nation. That should uh, get us to start thinking immediately when we really, you know, kind of grasp where that takes us. And how, how could we fall into that position? Is it possible that God's people, you and I, could fall into erroneous thinking where we actually think we're doing good and we're not. Before we start, let's bow our heads again for prayer. Father in heaven, as we begin this study, we especially pray for your presence here to be with us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be working not only through me as I present these thoughts, but Lord, I pray you'll be working in the hearts and minds of everyone here today, everyone who's listening online, those who may hear it in the future. We pray that this message will be what you want spoken, that you will help people to understand what we all need to understand as we look at unfolding events before us. We pray that you will prepare us, that you will give us the intellect, the intelligence, the understanding that we need, but more than this, Lord, give us the right heart, the right spirit, the right attitude, the commitment to serve you always, whatever the case may be. And we pray that you will work amongst us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to uh, begin this morning with an amazing fact. I hope that's not copyright infringement of some sort, but um, anyway, I want to start with this. April 6th, this past Tuesday, marked an interesting anniversary. It was the 125th anniversary of the modern Olympic Games. 1896, the Olympics were rebooted, restarted. But the story that's interesting to me is how they came to an end. Here's the account. On April 6, 1896, like I said, 125 years ago, the Olympic Games, a long lost tradition of ancient Greece, were reborn in Athens, 1,500 years after being banned by Roman Emperor Theodosius I. Now, the Olympic Games, right, contests, Greek contests, and they had been going on for centuries among the Greeks. Why would they come to an end? Interesting story here. With the rise of Rome, remember Rome took over Greece and came into power. 
the Olympics declined, and in 393 AD, the Roman Emperor Theodosius I, a Christian, abolished the games as part of his efforts to suppress paganism in the Roman Empire. The reason the Olympic Games were abandoned is because a Christian emperor decided it was for the good of the nation. He decided to suppress paganism as it pertained to the Olympic Games. Is that a good thing? Makes you think. Well, who wants paganism? I mean, paganism, I think we're all against paganism here, right? Um, so what's wrong with getting rid of that in the country? But it's more about this premise that as a Christian in a position of power in the country, that he would take that stand and make that move. And here's the reason. As we've been looking over the past few weeks, kind of a progression that comes about as we consider these things. We found that within the church back in the first three centuries A.D., there was a move to suppress heresy. As long as the people in power in the church had that power, they used their authority to suppress heresy. What happened then is that pretty soon the church had not only power in the church, but in the empire. After the rise of Constantine, of course, a lot of us are familiar with his famous decree in 321 A.D. that uh, made Sunday a formal day of worship and started the suppression of Sabbath. And then once the people in charge of the church, who could only suppress heresy within the church, had governmental power, now they started to suppress paganism. Ultimately, they were there to suppress everything outside of the established church system as they saw it. This is what's right. This is what's good. And they felt it their goal, their duty, maybe even their obligation to try to get rid of every error. Get rid of heresy in the church. Suppress paganism outside the church in terms of the empire. The interesting thing we learn as we follow that history through and we dive into the Dark Ages, we see the outcome of the thinking that in fact what they ultimately ended up suppressing was truth itself. The truth of God's Word was suppressed. In fact, even to the degree of it being taken away to where people didn't have access to it. So there was the suppression of, suppression of truth and truly the suppression of holiness. People the best of the people, the people who were the most godly, the most Christ-like, were the ones who were martyred, burned at the stake. And as we look at this kind of progression and we realize that what starts as doing something for the good of the people and the nation, at least ostensibly, um, at least that's the stated purpose, we can see how it can easily turn in the wrong direction. But I want us to consider if it was ever the right direction in the first place to suppress heresy. How far should we go? What should be suppressed? Well, I think we should never forget that God created all of us with free choice, and uh, if anyone has the authority and power to suppress all these things, it's God himself, amen? amen. And the fact that he doesn't maybe should give us some food for thought. Another question that comes to mind out of all of this to me, is it possible that freedom-loving Americans, Adventists who are proponents of religious liberty, is it possible that we could actually end up becoming the persecutors? As I read and I understand that uh, the people who are the professed people of God, there will be a shaking, there will be a thinning, there will be those who fall away, and we know that at the end there are only two classes. The ones who fall away will, yes, in fact, become the persecutors. And so the reason that I'm going through this, the reason that I'm looking at these historical lessons, 
These are not just a history of fulfilled prophecy, although that's valuable. But my intent is bigger. I think that we must have a clear understanding of the principles at stake so we're not swept away in the tide of evil. Somebody comes saying, we've got to get rid of this. We've got to do this good thing. We have to, we have to fix this over here and that. It would be easy to find ourselves getting on board with something that seems so good and yet find ourselves on the wrong side in the end. That's a concern of mine. As I read history, I have found that this takes place over and over and over, I should say, has in the past and I believe will continue to. Now, another one of the premises to that I started this series of sermons with is actually comes out of uh, great controversy where Ellen White talks about the image of the beast. If we want to know how the image is to be formed, and we're in the time when the image of the beast is being formed, if we want to understand how that takes place, we need to study how the image was formed. The events that formed the papacy actually show us the path that will be taken to form the image of the beast in the end. In other words, we can see how the beast's image is being formed if we know how the beast itself came to be. Does that make sense? It's kind of the, the starting point that we've had all along here is that the reason to look at this history and to see these events of the past is to understand what's happening right now and what's beginning to take place and what will take place moving forward as the image of the beast, as it's uh, foretold in Revelation 13, how that image is formed. And with that image comes certainly uh, persecution, even a death decree. I shared this slide last Sabbath on the deformation. And this is an overview, again, of where we've been. I talked about the things that have taken place in the early centuries within the state. That's one part of the equation. What happens in society? What happens in government? And we looked at things that happened back then, and we can see, as you go through those events, you can see things taking place around us that should make us stop and consider. What about the breaking down of the Constitution? If you weren't here, if you didn't hear those, they're, I believe, on YouTube. You can go back and review some of those things. Looking at the history itself, it seems like it could be something we're reading even out of our papers today. But there's two sides to the equation. On the other side is what happened in the church that led to this great apostasy in dark ages? And that's where I was talking last Sabbath, and this Sabbath I intend to continue more on that side of this, uh, this equation here, the church side and what takes place. Today it'll be a little different. Last time I looked specifically at what happened within those first three centuries. I want to build out of that, and I'll review some of that, but also show you that those same things are still with us and still a prevalent teaching and doctrine among us, even 2,000 years later. All right. <clears throat> the Deformation. The Reformation. Here's how I see it. We're not there yet. The Deformation, from the time of the Apostles, the things that took place that brought us down into that era of papal rule that we call the Dark Ages, took us down to a very dark and desperate time, certainly by the time the Reformation began. The Reformers came on, and certain reforms were made, bringing us back up. But I don't think we're there yet. In fact, the reason that I'm, I'm bringing this up is because the concern for me is that there are still little fragments of error that are still maybe with us, that have never been weeded out of Protestantism, that have maybe never even been weeded out of Adventism. And I think each of us as individuals needs to make sure that we are taking a solid, a solid look at God's Word and studying deeply to say, are we 
following exactly what God has asked us to do? Have we somehow either let false principles creep in, or are we still victims of a worldview that was prevalent for at least 1,500 years? Are there things that we think that are maybe a little off just because we've been around them so long that they're part of natural life? Well, this is just the way this is. And we use those things as an assumption, a preconceived idea that if we build on, will take us way off course. That's my concern. And while I don't have all the answers for each of you in every position, the one thing I do know is, is that the only way we're going to be where we need to be is to continue studying God's Word, seeking light that we need to be able to navigate the times that we're living in and what lies just ahead. So in other words, these are cautionary tales, if you will. The things that I'm talking about, the lessons of history particularly show how a skewed understanding was the premise for a whole system of error. In other words, being off on a certain understanding by the time it got way down the road was way off into the dark ages. And that's not the only time. Think about this. The apostles, you remember, they thought Jesus was going to conquer the Romans. Why did they think that? It was the prevailing worldview. In the context which they lived, this was just what everyone expected. And because it was what they'd always known, they bought into it. And they said, well, this must be the way it is. The Messiah is coming. He's going to deliver us from the Romans. You see how easily the best of people, people who walked with Jesus for years, could still be victims, if you will, of their upbringing, of their past. How are we going to get away from that? Again, I believe God's words are only hope because God is not willing that any should perish. He is looking to save every one of us. I mean, he's not going to let that stand in the way. Just because we had a bad upbringing or a bad background, that's, that's no problem for him if we'll let him do it. Another case in point is the Millerites back in the 1800s. One false idea. They thought that the earth to be cleansed was the sanctuary. And look at the disappointment, the heartache, the, the terrible struggle that came about as a result of that. Even though they were right in all the other points, one false premise just kind of shattered the whole experience for them. Interesting story. So, I guess with that said, we'll move on that uh, we need to be doing everything we can to understand where we should be, what we should be doing, where God wants us right now. Now, let me just review what I talked about last time I was here. I presented some of the thoughts in the early uh, centuries, again, specifically the first three centuries A.D., from four of the church fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Cyprian. By the way, these were Christians in a time when it wasn't popular to be Christian. They had to really stand up. In fact, all but Tertullian were martyred for their faith. Um, all were persecuted for their faith. These were not bad men in the sense that we usually think they were bad men. And yet these four men basically took a path and took their understanding and their well-meaning ideas to a place that brought about uh, really the destruction of the apostolic church. And it was all because these four men were suppressors of heresy and supporters of unity. Wow, that sounds like us. Certainly, we don't want heresy. Certainly, we do want unity in Christianity and in our faith. These are the things that we want. But how do we go about getting them? And here's where things can go crazy, is when we take God's work into our own hands. The teachings of these church fathers, basically in su succession, we went over last time, the supremacy of the bishop. The bishop should be treated as equal to God, they said. Specifically, that was uh, um, <coughs> Ignatius that said that. 
And following on that, each of them added a little more. Irenaeus came up with this idea of apostolic succession and the certain gift of truth that certain men, in other words, the people who are up front here at the pulpit, that's the clergy, if it came from them, you could count on it because they have the gift through apostolic succession of being able to tell you what the truth is. After that came church orders. We have to make sure it's clear. You're the laity, we're the clergy. Don't get that out of line here. You could go way off course if you aren't listening to me. You can see how all these things develop. I hope you understand I'm saying that facetiously. Jesus said, there's one who is your master, Jesus. All ye are brethren. Doesn't matter if you're sitting out there or standing up here. We're all brethren. We're all here with one head, one person we look to. Amen? The next thing that came on was this idea of sacramental efficacy. Wow. Whatever that means, right? Sacraments. Things like baptism and communion and certainly ordination because this was specifically came about as the idea of church orders. You know, you have the bishop, you have deacons, you have priests, you have all of this line of church orders. And sacramental efficacy meant that when the sacrament is performed, it actually makes the thing happen. All kinds of things come out of this. And then a sacerdotal system, the idea of the sacrifices and the service all taking place, making church what church is. I'm going to be uh, sharing a lot today out of a very special book. It is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is my copy. I uh, will not be preaching out of this, but I am going to share you a few, share with you a few of the items in there. And the reason for that is, is because I want you to understand that the principles that came about in those early centuries are still the foundation for that system. Today, my idea is not to say anything harsh about Catholics, they're God's children, but I'm talking about a system. And the system went way off course hundreds of years ago, nearly 2,000 years ago. But the point is, nothing's been done within that system to correct it. And the ideas that seem so close to good ideas, very close to what would be true and sound doctrine, if you think them through, actually go contrary to Scripture. And so that's what I want to do, is share with you some of these thoughts today and demonstrate... Um, how thinking can get us off course one way or the other and lead us into terrible conclusions. So let me take an approach. There's different catechisms. This one is um, not put in question and answer format. It is actually essentially the full beliefs of the Catholic Church. And it's put in, in fact, when I make references to it, they aren't page numbers, it's actually numbered paragraphs. Some of you have a background in Catholicism, and you're going to be familiar with this. Um, but they're references, and they're saying, this is what the church believes today. Some of those references cite, in fact, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Cyprian. They still cite those fathers as a basis, as a source. These men were right back there next to the apostles, so what they had to say, I mean, it's essentially the word of God itself. In fact, I don't have time to go into all of it, but the study of tradition, capital T versus small t tradition, is fascinating to me. The idea that if you're in the apostolic line of succession, your voice is the apostolic voice. It's the voice of God and should be taken that way by all the laity. So I'm going to take a question and answer approach here just to show you some of the, the logical outcome of some of these, this thought process, okay? How we get from seeking purity in the church to where the church dominates the conscience, okay? So the first question that came up is we have all these people saying different things about this is truth and this is truth. How do we know who to believe? How do we know what to believe is true? 
And the answer to that, as we talked about last week, that came about uh, through the fathers is, that how you know the pure doctrine is, it's the doctrine that comes from the bishop. In other words, you listen to the bishop, the bishop is the one who will keep you on course. And right there we have a problem because the principle that is laid out when we do that is now the messenger, not the message, is what determines truth. You don't test truth by this. You test truth by the bishop and whatever he says. Because you probably don't understand this anyway. So, just set that aside. You don't worry about this. You just make sure you listen to the bishop and he'll keep you on course. Basic thought. But the problem is, it takes away the authority of the Bible. Do you see this? Simple thought seems reasonable, but it takes away the authority of the Word and replaces it with a man, a human authority. Well, then the next question is, how do you know the true bishops from the heretic bishops? Well, yeah, just because somebody claims to be a bishop, you can't take his word for it, right? Because he might be a heretic bishop. Logical? That would be the next step. Once we know that you get your truth from the bishop, we better make sure you're getting it from the one who's teaching truth, not heresy, right? Well, here's what was laid down as the idea. The answer to that is, well, the true bishops come through the line of the apostles. Certainly. Well, Paul, Peter, James, they knew this man, and then this man, they passed on the gift of truth to him, and now he has the truth. And then he had students, disciples, and he taught that truth to them, but not only that, he actually passed it on to them, and now they are the ones that have truth. If you're not connected to the apostles, you don't have truth, but if you are, that's the person you can trust. Logical next step. And so the principle laid down here is that connection to the church determines who the true messenger is. In other words, if it's this group here, by the way, um, Irenaeus, or Tertullian, one of them was the first one to actually use the term Catholic Church, meaning universal, meaning this is the right, this is the true, this is the whole idea. And they started developing the idea of putting your faith in the church instead of the word. Interesting. Connection to the church determines the true messenger. In fact, let's look at what Irenaeus had to say. Interestingly, in his book, Against Heresies, or his writing, it wasn't really a book per se, Against Heresies, the true bishops are, his words, those who, as I have shown, possess the succession from the apostles, those who together with the succession of the episcopate, in other words, not only did they receive the office of the episcopate, but they have received the certain gift of truth. That means when they were passed down from the apostles in this line of succession, when that authority was passed down, also the certain gift of truth, meaning that whatever they say is true, just like what the apostles said. And so everything they say, you can count on. According to the good pleasure of the Father, he says. Okay, so then we move on. This raises some other questions. How does a bishop get into the apostolic line and receive this gift? Wait a minute, how, how do we know which one's in the line and which one's not? How does this all happen? The gift is passed from bishop to succeeding bishop. In other words, as I just explained, one bishop, he has it. So now I have the gift of truth. Now, whoever I lay my hands on and ordain will also have that gift of truth. Right? And then they do the same and on down the line. Do you follow how this happens? And so again, another principle was established is, is that the certain gift of truth is in men rather than the word. And it's passed from man to man. You can completely do <laughs> without the scriptures under this system. Do you follow what's happening here? Everything is about the hierarchy, the structure this whole complexity of passing it on and building the system rather than pointing to the word. <clears throat> Once again, then, how does the apostolic gift get in the bishop? Wait a minute. How, how does the actual gift, how does it happen that one bishop 
can get from the other bishop, sure, everything he says is true. How does that get to me? So now when I say it, it's true. If I'm up here in the pulpit preaching it, then it has to be true because as the one in the line of succession, I have the certain gift of truth. And this is where they had the sacrament of ordination and the idea of the efficacy, that's a great word, efficacy of the sacraments. Meaning it's actually effective. Meaning that it is actually in man that has this gift to pass it on to another man, the gift, and so it goes on down the line. The idea you have to have, it's not just symbolic. In Adventism, the things that we do, the baptism, communion you're having next Sabbath, these are actions we do designed to teach us spiritual truths, to help us to understand the reality. But efficacy of the sacrament says the sacrament is the reality. It's not just a symbolic gesture. It's the thing actually taking place. And so, in fact, what happens is you start getting more and more of a power structure in the church because the people who have this sacred power, and by the way, sacred power, I'm going to read to you a little bit about. These are terms from the catechism. Sacred power, right, is granted by men in positions of power. It's always a top-down. And so what happens is, naturally, in the human heart, with the idea of trying to move self forward, you want more authority, more power, and so this big system of top-down, from the Pope to the body of bishops and on down through the whole system. And even though I'm talking about this in terms of the, the Roman Catholic structure, because that's what falls into the historic narrative I'm in, it is not limited to that. Remember what I said a little bit ago about do we have any leftover remnants? When we look at around, the vast majority of Protestantism still has a lot of the same basic mindset, the same underpinnings. And in some respects, I really think we need to be looking carefully at what we do as Adventists, that as an Adventist church, because even... I find this myself that um, because I'm up here, sometimes people, especially with a background and an underpinning of looking at the bishop, will look the same way to me as just one of God's instruments to share the message as if I'm something special or have something special about me. And I will always try to back you down from that. In fact, you've heard me say it here before. You can't trust me. What I mean is, I'm going to tell you to the best of my ability the truth, but this is where your trust is. It can only be in God's Word. If you start trusting in man for truth, you're going to find yourself in a very bad place. So, moving on. Well, let me comment on this here. This, uh, as we take a turn in direction here. I'm going to actually go to some of the statements now that, based on what I just told you, that, that show that this is, is Catholic system teaching. There's, there's a couple of reasons I want to do this. First of all, don't you hate it when somebody misstates your faith? When somebody comes and says, oh yeah, yeah, you're those people who believe such and such, you know. Oh yeah, you believe this or that or the other thing. We've probably all heard a number of them. Um, that it's one thing, I don't mind it if somebody says, oh, you're those people who keep Sabbath, because that I do. But there's so much false information around, and people will judge you by what they've heard about you. So that's one of the reasons. What I, the reason that I want to read these statements out of the Catholic Catechism is because this is their statement of their faith on their belief. I'm not accusing them of anything randomly, falsely, or whatever. We're, we're going to read it uh, from them themselves. I'm putting it on the screen, so I'm going to leave the book over there. But uh, if you need, I'll, I'll turn you to the page if you want, okay? But the ideas here are ones that they hold and believe proudly. So I'm not putting them down in that sense or anything like that. 
But what I am saying is this system, like I said, it's not about people, it's about a system. This system that was set up 2,000 years ago is still intact. I have also heard, even in Adventist circles, say, well, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, there's a lot like in great controversy that's been said, but they're not like that anymore. They've changed. They're better. I'll let you judge that, okay? So in the next few minutes, I'm just going to point out some of the things that deal specifically with what I talked about last week and these few things that we just reviewed here, okay? So let's start. This is from the Catholic Catechism. The Church is apostolic because... Let me stop right there for a second. It's very important to prove who the true church is because according to the Nicene Creed, the church is one holy, Catholic, apostolic church. And those are the four key things. They have to be one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Apostolic is a very important thing to determine who the true church is. And here, this statement in support of that says the church is apostolic because she is founded on the apostles. She continues to be taught, sanctified, and guided by the apostles until Christ's return. Now, I can say that. I can say, yeah, what the apostles say right here, right? Are, are we not somewhat taught and guided by the apostles through God's word? Okay. Except that it goes on from there, and it says, through their successors in pastoral office. The College of Bishops, assisted by priests, in union with the successor of Peter, that is the Pope, the church's supreme pastor. Do you follow what happens there? The church continues to be taught by the apostles, right, through the men today, the successors, those in the line of apostolic succession. The idea is that even though the apostles are dead, the church leaders today are just like the apostles, and you are being taught by the apostles. If you're being taught by the leaders, you're being taught by the apostles. Again, catechism, that 857 is a paragraph reference number you can look up uh, in the catechism. <clears throat> Indeed, it says, the apostolic preaching was to, pre was to be preserved in a continuous line of succession until the end of time. Diverbum is the, uh, let me see if I can remember this, it's the Constitution, something about Catholic belief. It comes from Vatican II. It's a statement of their faith, and they quote what came out of Vatican II as the foundation for what they're putting here in the Catechism. The word order, it says, in Roman antiquity. By the way, this gives us, I, I mentioned um, before, ordination was actually, Tertullian's idea was to say, well, in, in the civil society, we have these different levels of government and governmental authority. So, let's do that in the church. Let's make sure we have these right orders of authority in the church. And he followed what the world had and brought it into the church. And in fact, in the catechism, it affirms this. The word order in Roman antiquity designated an established civil body. In other words, we take our direction from that, especially a governing body. So in the church, picture it just like the government. And ordinatio, obviously you can see the connection to ordination, means incorporation into an ordo. So ordination actually puts you in this different position. Interesting. It goes on here. This is a quote from Irenaeus. In order that the full and living gospel might always be preserved in the church, the apostles left bishops as their successors. You follow this? The apostles left bishops as their successors. Now this isn't what the Bible says. This is what they say and read into scriptures that so that we can be sure we have the full gospel, the apostles passed this on. To preserve the gospel, the apostles left bishops as their successors. They gave them their own position of teaching authority. Okay, so the apostles had a position of teaching authority. Even though, again, Jesus said, no, no, no. There's one teacher, right? Don't be called teacher or rabbi. That's what Jesus' counsel was. But they say, no, 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 the apostles were teachers, and they had teaching authority. They had the authority to teach this certain gift of truth, and that was passed on to their successors. 
Since the sacrament of holy orders is the sacrament of the apostolic ministry, in other words, this idea of ordination and passing this apostolic succession down, since the sacrament of holy orders, that's what they call ordination is the rite, the sacrament of holy orders, sacrament of apostolic ministry, it is for the bishops as the successors of the apostles to hand on the gift of the Spirit, the apostolic line. Validly ordained bishops, i.e. those who are in the line of apostolic succession, validly confer the three degrees of the sacrament of holy orders. Just as I was sharing earlier, it's not, this is not about something, a calling from the Lord. This is not about the Lord's work. This is about the work of one person passing on a gift to the next and so on, on down the line. The word ordination, according to the catechism, is reserved for the sacramental act which integrates a man into the order of bishops, presbyters, or deacons. You saw the three orders that it talked about earlier, okay? So ordination is how it all happens in the Catholic mindset. It goes beyond, now notice these words, it goes beyond a simple election, designation, delegation, or institution by the community. Now, I think most of us here understand ordination to be something more like that, the idea of recognizing a person, recognizing their gift, choosing that person to fulfill the role in our local body, and so on. But their point here is, no, no, it's much more than that. In the Catholic system, it is much more than a simple election, a designation, a delegation, or institution by the community. What is it? It confers a gift of the Holy Spirit that permits the exercise of a sacred power, which can come only from Christ himself through his church. You know, it's interesting because these lines like this, this can only come through Christ himself. That part sounds really good. But when you step back and you understand the full picture through his church, what we find more and more is, is that the church interjects itself between Christ and the layperson. That the church, comprised of its leaders, is now intermediary. And the only way that this can happen is through this church. There is no connection directly. I'm going to pause right here because this brings me to a point of the Reformation. And I mentioned this last time, and I want you to have this fresh in your minds this time. That what really struck at the heart of the Roman Catholic system when the Reformation began, I know that when you think Reformation, if you're like me, the first thing that comes to mind is justification by faith. That had an incredible impact on Martin Luther himself. But what really got him in trouble and undermined, well, what made him the enemy of the church is what the two teachings that undermined the authority of the church. One of those was priesthood of all believers. The idea that every person doesn't need the church in between, but each person can talk directly to God and can receive, from directly, receive directly from the Lord. That's one idea, and the other one is sola scriptura. You can see how every part of the system that we're talking about is about the church and the church having authority and people in the church and the authority structure through ordination, all of these things. And so when you say, no, 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 this is the authority for everything, it's to take the whole system and just turn it upside down. Moving on. Celebrated worthily in faith, the sacraments confer the grace that they signify. They are efficacious because in them Christ himself is at work. Um, this starts to really bother me a little bit because, again, it sounds good on one hand, but the idea that we do something and because it's celebrated worthily, because it's in faith, that then this sacrament actually confers this sacred power, it's efficacious, it does the work of itself, because Christ himself is at work, is in essence saying, 
of course, as the bishop, I'm doing the work of Christ. Whatever I do is true. Whatever I say is true. Whatever I do is the work of Christ. And it starts to sound a little bit about like putting himself in the place of Christ. Doesn't it to you? In them, Christ himself is a word. It is he Christ who baptizes. He who acts in his sacraments in order to communicate the grace that each sacrament signifies. So now, men have the power to do the works of Christ. This is where the, pro, the idea of excommunication comes in, is that that now can actually be withheld. In other words, you can't have access. Excommunication means to remove access to Christ and put you essentially in a hopeless state. From the moment that a sacrament is celebrated in accordance with the intention of the church, every time we turn around, not that it's celebrated, but in accordance with the intention of the church, the power of Christ and his spirit acts in and through it. You start, instead of Jesus controlling his church, his church is controlling Jesus and the power. It's a little bit like, you remember Simon, was it? Simon Magnus? I want some of that. You guys are doing all these miracles and everything. I want some of that so I can do that too. The idea of the man having the power. It is such a fine line to usurp the position of Christ, isn't it? To put yourself in the place where only Christ belongs. This sacrament, holy orders being talked about here, configures the recipient to Christ by a special grace of the Holy Spirit, so that he may serve as Christ's instrument for his church. So now he serves as Christ's instrument for his church. By ordination, one is enabled to act as a representative of Christ, head of the church, in his triple office of priest, prophet, and king. Now, in one sense, we should all be representatives of Christ. People should be able to see Christ's work in us, and, and we should be the light of the world. But in the sense that it's being used here, this representative of Christ, the head, goes beyond that. Apostolic powers, the certain gift of truth, these are my words, are bestowed by the church, and the church is comprised of the clergy who possess the powers and the gift. And the reason I wanted to pause and throw this in is because, right, the powers are bestowed by the church, but the church is made out of the bestowed powers. So you have this self-perpetuating system that keeps itself as the center and the source of everything. If there's going to be any Christ or God in your life, it's going to come through this system, through this church. The ministries conferred by ordination are irreplaceable for the organic structure of the church. That's a way of saying the church basically as a body and institution so on can't exist without these ministries that are conferred through this process. Without the bishop, presbyters, and deacons, one cannot speak of the church. In other words, without that hierarchy, that leadership, there is no church. The church is not the body of believers in this system. The church is the hierarchy of leadership the bishops, the presbyters, and deacons. In the ecclesial service, and this takes us right down to basically the conclusion here, in the ecclesial service, that means as church is being conducted, performed, as the services are going on, the service of the ordained minister, it is Christ himself who is present to his church as head of his body. This is what the church means by saying that the priest by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders. In other words, because the priest has had these sacred powers conferred upon him, he acts in persona Christi Capitis. I don't know, that's my best shot at the Latin. It is the same priest, Christ Jesus, whose sacred person his minister truly represents. In other words, when the minister is doing it, it's Christ doing it. If the minister does it, it's Christ. Now, it goes on to say, the minister, by reason of the sacerdotal consecration, by reason of this gift that he's been given, which he has received, he is truly made like to 
the high priest, and possesses the authority to act in the power and place of the person of Christ himself. I can't help but consider, well, I'll wait to go on to that, the idea of being able to act in the person, in the place, act in the power of Christ. Again, not in a representative sense, but by reason of the consecration, that thing that you have received through another man in the line of apostolic succession, you're made like the high priest, and you possess the authority to act in the power and place of, that, that line's the one that really caught my attention, in place of the person of Christ himself. And this took us to the logical conclusion when you put all this together, outside the church there is no salvation. It only makes sense. By the way, this is, this is stated out of the catechism. It is uh, directly quoted from Cyprian. One translation, you'll find a little different wording because it's all translated from Cyprian's Latin uh, text. But Cyprian, as I told you, back in the late 200s AD, said this, and this is still held on to, and the church still teaches, there is no salvation outside the church. Stop and consider this. Paul said that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, but the papacy says outside the church there is no salvation. And to me, when I put those two in contrast, I can't, I can't get where the catechism gets. And a question comes to my mind, does salvation come through the power of God or through the church? Where does our salvation come from? And I wonder sometimes about people who leave their Bible on the shelf all week long and then come to church, dare I say it, on Sabbath, and expect that to be their one meal for the week. Just ask yourself, if that's you, where does your salvation come from? from the power of God and his word? Or are you expecting it to come somehow through the church? Makes you think. And as I said before this uh, about the priest acting in the person and place of Christ, it reminded me of these uh, texts, 2 Thessalonians we read last week, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ's coming, will not come unless the falling away the word there, falling away, is apostasia, or apostasy. Until the apostasy comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. We have seen the result of these teachings in the first three centuries, how they developed into the Dark Ages. And we can see in the Catechism today that those same principles are actually held up and supported, and the same fathers are quoted saying this is where we stand today interesting that day will not come unless a falling away comes first the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition those are strong words who opposes and exalts himself notice the spirit of self-exaltation once it starts in the church the church is in trouble let none of us go there the problem here is I'm not here to point out, hey, I'm not here to say, hey, don't ever become a Catholic. That's not my intent here. My intent here is to question ourselves and say, where am I thinking in a way that could lead me down a wrong path? And so the first place, the very important thing that, that designates who the man of sin, who the son of perdition is, is it's a person who in the very first instance exalts self. And if we have a problem with exalting self, as most of us are prone to, we better be on our knees constantly saying, Lord, keep me in the position I need to be. Help me remember that you're the head and I'm not. Help me remember where I belong. Don't allow the spirit of self-exaltation in. Because it's the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And while that applies in a general way to this system of the Dark Ages, this system that is still there in principle, the idea of being in the place of God instead of God, it's the church, it can actually be a place, it could be in our lives, it can have place in our lives on an individual basis. 
if we allow wrong thinking to creep in, the same results follow. Smaller scale, but it's the same thinking and the same thought. And so persecution does not always come from a mean spirit, intentional hatred, or malicious motives. And the reason I added always, somebody questioned me when I said something along these lines a week ago, says, well, I think you're giving too much credit to people. Some of these people really are that. Okay, I grant that. But what's interesting in the history I'm outlining is, is that these are not people who any of the evidence would show had that kind of a spirit. And that, in fact, often persecution, where it ultimately comes from, the, the bottom line is it actually comes from a conscientious spirit, a humanitarian goodwill, and a magnanimous motives. And I tell you this, don't believe it because I'm saying it, you just watch. But as things unfold, as the image of the beast is formed, we will see the argument being made over and over and over. It's for the good of the country. It's for the good of the people. It's for good. For the good of society. We need to do this, that, and the other thing. We need to make sure our religion is on track and right before God. We need to do all these wonderful things. Don't let the heretics have a place in this society. Get rid of them. Put them down. It will all be done for the good by people with a conscientious spirit, humanitarian goodwill, and magnanimous motives. And my fear is that some of us will look at this and say, well, how can that be bad? That's a really good idea that oh, so-and-so has. Oh, man, the senator from here, that congressman over there, that's a wonderful idea. Man, wouldn't society be better if we just did what he said? Don't be misled. It's a time we need to be really studying what God's Word says, what the prophecies are saying is going to happen, and where we need to stand individually. And I, I'll continue to say individually, because while the Catechism teaches there is no salvation outside the church, the counter of that is that somehow as long as you're still in church, you're okay. The church will not be saved as a collective. The church is only the body of believers, and each of us will be saved based on our own decisions, what we choose to do. The driving motive of the early bishops was to eliminate heresy within the Christian faith. And here's the lesson. If Satan can, in the slightest degree, introduce the principle of man putting himself in the place of God, trying to eliminate heresy in God's church, trying to weed out the tares, as Jesus put it, when he said clearly, now's not the time, and you're not the people. It's at the end of time, and it's the angels who will do the work when I tell them to. But if Satan can introduce this principle, he's already ensured success of his mission. But take heart. I am going to close with another verse from 2 Thessalonians. After... Paul talks about the man of sin and the son of perdition, the falling away, and all these things that we watch. He says this, and this is awesome. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Okay, we know what's going on, we know all this, but there's a reason to be thankful. We give thanks to God always for you, brethren, because God from the beginning chose you. Months ago, I gave a sermon on assurance. God chose us, each one of us, and I'm going to reiterate that here. We need to know this, that in fact, all of us are only here, born at this time in earth's history right now, is because God chose us to be on his side and do a good work. He gives us free choice not to, but the truth is, that's his plan for us. He has a plan and a purpose, and we can have that. And we can be thankful. God, from the beginning, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Not through the church, but through what? Sanctification of the Spirit, who we have direct access to, and belief in the truth. That's where we stand, and God has chosen us to stand there and to be victorious, whatever may come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
We have looked at a lot of history over the past couple months. We've seen what's happened in the world. We've seen the results of bad decision making, bad choices, um, the, the things that maybe were done even with the best intentions and motives turned the wrong direction. Lord, we pray that you will show us our own hearts, show us our own minds. We know there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is a way of destruction. And so what may seem right to us, Lord, we want you to show us what is right. We pray that you will give us a new motivation to study your word more, to dig deeper, Lord, because the times demand it. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to know your voice so that we're not drawn away by an imposter. Lord, I pray for everyone here this morning, everyone that uh, serves you and follows you around the world to hold fast to your word, to base their faith on your truth and to serve you and you alone. Lord, we pray for our salvation and the salvation of those we love. In Jesus' name, amen.